This video deals with curves and scalar fields defined on manifolds and how an associated directional derivative can produce partial derivative operators that can be used as coordinate basis vectors. This result is of some importance to general relativity. So here's a manifold with a coordinate curve shown, x1 direction, x2 direction. Now the coordinate lines in general are given by this position vector, which is a function of the x1 and x2 variables. And the individual coordinate lines are given by the x1 is given by r as a function of x1, and where x2 is given a constant fixed value. So for each value of x2, this describes the coordinate line in the x1 direction. So c2 is some number that's equal to b or something like that, then we'll get this x1 line here, for instance, this purple one there. The x2 coordinate lines are given by the position vector where x1 is held constant, different values, and x2 is allowed to vary. So there's some value a maybe for c1, and, if, and uh, x1 equals a, and then we vary x2, we get this orange line here. All right, let's consider some curve on, on the manifold specified by this position vector parameterized in terms of variable lambda. So each of the coordinates are given by this function here, and lambda is some variable by which we parameterize the curve. Basis vector z subscript mu uh, equals x superscript mu, and the basis vector z subscript mu, and mu has the values 1 and 2 for this manifold, for this example. All right, now let's imagine some point p on the curve, anywhere on the curve, just a point p. The tangent vector to the curve of that point is shown in red here. And notice that the tangent vector lies in the tangent plane. So this is the tangent plane touching the curve at the one point, here it is, and this tangent plane spreads in both directions, the x1 and x2 directions, and is flat. So the, so the point P, the tangent vector, the point P, lies in the tangent plane, and that is flat Euclidean. And what we're saying there is at the point P, and and endpoints very close to the point P, around the point P, the manifold looks Euclidean, approximately Euclidean. The further away we move from the point P, the further away we move that is, the less Euclidean it looks. So for a small region around the point P, and that's what's represented by the tangent plane here, this looks approximately Euclidean, even though the manifold as a whole is obviously curved. All right, so we have our tangent vector t to the curve at the point p. The tangent vector, as we pointed out, lies in the tangent plane to the manifold at p. And the idea here is that the manifold in the immediate region about the point p is approximately Euclidean. The further away we move from p, the less so. Now, the coordinate lines of the tangent plane are the same as those of the manifold. So if you have a look close up at the point p here, you can see the coordinate lines on the tangent plane are the same as those on the manifold. They're inherited, if you like, from the manifold. Right, here's our tangent vector written out with basis vectors e1 and e2 and the components dx1 d lambda, dx2 d lambda, and so here's our tangent plane. Here's the tangent vector t in red, our first basis vector e1 in the x1 direction, as discussed on the previous slides, and x, uh, e2 in the x2 direction. So writing the tangent vector out in this flat Euclidean plane, that's what we get. All right, so the tangent vector now, if we write this in components, t superscript mu times the basis e subscript mu, or dx mu du lambda e mu, in expanded form as shown earlier. Now the basis vectors in general are given by e1 is the partial derivative of the position vector shown earlier with respect to x1, and similarly for e2, it will be the partial derivative of the of the um, position vector with respect to x2. Now at a point, at the point p equals a b, the basis vectors are given by e1, and the e1 direction is dr, x1, x2 held constant because we're at the point uh, at 
x2 equals b, and we get the partial derivative of r with respect to x1. Same for e2, the partial derivative of the position vector with respect to x2, but where x1 is held constant, because we're just at this point here, the point a, b. All right, here we are again, just reminding you of the tangent plane and the basis vectors in the x1, x2 direction. All right, now let's say that some arbitrary scalar function f is defined on our manifold, where f equals f as a function of x1 and x2. And we're interested in what happens to f at the point p equals ab. Now the change in f in the x1 direction is given by df dx1 as the limit as h approaches 0. The usual definition you're familiar with, f of x1 plus h, comma x2 minus the scalar function all over h in the limit as h approaches 0. Along the coordinate curve x2 equals b, which includes the point p equals ab, that's just where x2 equals b, the change in f is given by df dx1 as the limit as h approaches 0, and x2 is replaced with b, because we want all along the line x2 equals b. Alright, here we are. Now, df dx1 points in this direction, and df dx2 points in that direction. So the change in f in this direction is what df dx1 gives us, and df dx2 gives us a change in f in this direction, in the x2 direction. Alright, now the partial derivative of f with respect to x1 gives the rate of change of f in the direction of the maximal increase of x1 that way, to the right there, and same for df dx2 in that direction there, in the upwards direction as you're viewing the screen. This direction of maximal increase in x1 is the same direction in which the basis vector e1 points. So here we are, e1 and e2, and notice df dx1 points in the same direction as e1, and df dx2 points in the same direction as e2. That is, how does the scalar function change in each of these directions, in the x1 direction and in the x2 direction? All right, at any point p on the curve, the directional derivative of f is given by df d lambda is the partial derivative of f with respect to x mu, dx mu d lambda. So there's the components. And this gives the rate of change of f in the direction of the tangent vector of the curve, and it can be written as the above expression with just these two components interchanged. And then we dx d mu lambda is t superscript mu, components of the tangent vector, times df dx mu. So that's the directional derivative of f in the direction of the tangent vector. So how does, how does the function f change at the point p in the direction of the tangent vector? And that's what this gives us. But f is entirely arbitrary. And so we can write the directional derivative operator in the form d d lambda is t superscript mu times this object here, the partial derivative operator. So this directional derivative operator d d lambda contains the components of the tangent vector t superscript mu and a set of partial derivative operators d dx mu that point in the same directions as the basis vectors e subscript mu. So here we go. Just remind you of the earlier picture, there's a tangent vector t. And here we have E1 and E2, and the partial derivative of F in the X1 direction points this way to the right, and the change in F, partial derivative of F in the X2 direction points up the page like this in the same direction as E2. So this operator dd lambda contains the same information as the tangent vector T equals T superscript mu times E to the mu, E to the subscript mu. This means we can identify the basis vectors E subscript mu with the partial derivative operators d dx mu. And that also means that we can identify any vector V equals V mu E subscript mu as a directional derivative by rewriting its components in this form here. And further to this, we can use the partial derivative operators d dx mu as a set of coordinate basis vectors, just like E subscript mu. Now these vector components, V superscript mu, are both linear, there's no powers of them, 
and the Lorentz invariant as well, and they follow the rules of vector algebra. I won't go into that here because that's not the goal of this video. All right, this definition of a vector as a directional derivative replaces that of the directed line segments, since the latter cannot be generalized to non-Euclidean manifolds. So in flat Euclidean space, we can add and subtract vectors because the basis vectors are constants th throughout the whole flat space. But in curved spaces, it's not possible to add or subtract vectors because the basis vectors change from point to point. This image here of the manifold is the basis vector E1 at the point A. Here it is at the point B. Here it is at the point C. All three point in different directions. And all the way along there, the basis vectors change direction all along this manifold, along that coordinate line there. So we can't add or subtract vectors as we do in Euclidean space. What we can do though is we can compare the directions of different vectors at different points. And that's why it's an important result for general relativity. There we are.